tell us a little bit about how you all found the story and began this process of bringing this film together. Well, I wasn't at the company yet, so I'll let Mike answer this. Um, sure. So we were big Dennis Lehane fans, and uh, it was right when our company started about five years ago when we were looking for material. And uh, one of the things we looked at was an anthology of short stories called Boston Noir that Dennis had edited. And he contributed this story as, as his contribution to the anthology. Uh, we read it and thought, wouldn't it be cool if we asked Lehane if he wanted to adapt it? Uh, at that point, he hadn't really written a screenplay professionally. Um, he'd done some work on The Wire and some other TV work, but not yet written a feature. So we were very lucky to be able to convince him, and convince him at a good price, actually, um, because it was his first one uh, to do this. And uh, we went through a bunch of drafts, um, all which were very good. It just was sort of trying to take something that read very prose heavy into a more traditional screenplay format. Um, it took about a year, year and a half, and then we put it together following that. Now, since it was a short story, and, and I understand that you work quite a bit with Dennis on you know fleshing it out, tell us a little bit about your process in terms of working with a, a writer of his esteem to you know make the story come together. Yes, tell us about that. <laughs> I, I, you know, I think Dennis is a huge, huge movie buff, huge TV buff, so he, he understands these things intuitively. He knew right off the bat that it wasn't going to be simply a question of doing the same thing in a short story. I think he was very open and uh, realistic about what would have to change and what would have to be bigger. Uh, so right off the bat, from the beginning, um, he was very open to ideas and, and pitched us immediately the Detective Torres character, um, which was not in the short story as a way of giving a little bit more tension, giving a little bit more scope to the world. So that was probably the biggest change from the short story. Um, you know, and then we played up some of the elements with the gangsters that you don't really see at all in the short story, like the scene in the van where they put the bolt through there. Um, you know, a couple times when they come to the bar to harass them, all those kind of things that you could build up. And, and, the, uh, and the robbery beats we played up as well. You didn't really ever see those people in, in the short story. It was uh, the Fitz character, you know, the two kids in the car and the one to get thrown over. All that stuff was new. Uh, but he was super open to it. And, you know, I think for him it was just literally like a question of format. I mean, the first script was page and page of prose, and then we worked and got it into a little better, you know, more traditional shape. He's also one of those people who's ridiculously fast and agile. So maybe because he had never done it before, uh, or maybe because he's just that kind of superhuman, it was all so incredibly quick. And he was so agile at, at changing things. I, I love the concept of the drop bar and, and how that's sort of the you know the back backbone of this whole sort of story. Was that in the original story originally? The short story? Yeah, that's a, that's in the short story, um, but it's, it's it's something that Dennis made up. It's not a real underworld thing. Um, and I think this it sort of I forget what exactly said it came from, but he sort of just thought wouldn't it be cool if this existed and built that as the basis of the story. You, you know, the, the PGA has its own drop bar. We, we, call, <laughs> we call ours Thursday Thursdays. <laughs> Anyways, um, the, you know, the, car, the, the heart of the story really is the relationship with Rocco the dog and how that kind of changes Bob and brings him out of his shell. It's never easy to work with animals. Tell us a little bit about how you picked uh, the dog to play Rocco and manage that through the course of the production. Dogs. <laughs> there were multiple dogs. Uh, well, first of all, it, we, um, you know, it was Mikael, the director's choice, what kind of dog it was going to be, and he very specifically chose a pit bull because he felt that that was a very misunderstood breed um, and a deceiving breed in much the way that um, Tom's character in the movie, Bob, is kind of misunderstood in many ways. Um, and then it became a practical issue in terms of continuity and filming, um, how much the dog was going to grow and when we were shooting what. And because, um, well, because it was a puppy and also because animal handlers are, you know, very particular about the way their animals are handled. Um, it, <coughs> it was an interesting process because nobody else was really allowed to touch the dog or bond with the dog except for Tom. And I think we were lucky because we weren't doing something where the dog had to do a lot. You know, it's basically, Mikhail said to the actors, just let the dog do what it does and respond to it. 
it wasn't as if we needed to do a trick or to be in a certain spot. So it was pretty easy overall. Um, and they're puppets, so we couldn't really train them much anyway. <laughs> So, so your your cast and your your behind the camera and from the camera is full of incredibly talented people, award nominated, award winning people. <laughs> Tell us about how you brought this entire team together: director, <laughs> actors, everyone. Uh, well, Mike, as I said, when I came to the company, Mike had already turned it into a screenplay, and when I came to the company, it was a question of figuring out. It was. It was uh, developed at Fox 2000, and we moved it to a different division at Fox, Fox Searchlight, and uh, interviewed several directors, talked to people on the phone, and watched Mikhail's first movie, which was Bullhead, which if you haven't seen it, you should. It's amazing. Um, and found ourselves in this weird position of, of talking to this Belgian guy who had never made an English language film, and talking about a movie that at that point was set in Boston. and. He seemed to have such an affinity for it and such a love for it, and we just, you know, as I said, we loved his first movie, we loved his vision for this movie, so he seemed like an obvious fit. Um, we hired him, and then, again, Tom seemed kind of obvious. I mean, there weren't that many people who you could hang a whole movie on, who could be a lead of a movie, who would be willing or able to still be in this size of a movie because as I said at that point it was already a Fox Searchlight um, and there's some actors that don't want to do that kind of scale of movie um, and we kind of got creative in the deal making process and uh, put him into place and then the rest of the cast you know that too yeah I would say yeah. I would say the hardest part um, was figuring out our director. Once we had Mikhail, we got Tom very quickly, and the rest of the cast, once you had Tom and Mikhail, uh, went from there. And I think part of what attracted us to Mikhail was that we knew that this, that the performance at the center of this movie had to be spot on, um, and there was only a few actors we thought could do it. And then we watched Bullhead, um, Matias Schoenars, who plays Eric Deeds, and this movie's the star of that movie. Um, and his performance in that is incredible, and we knew it was the kind of performance that would attract an actor like Tom. So once once we had the screenplay, once we got on Kale, it was very, very quick on the casting and into production from there. I, I understand Numi actually, you know, really sort of lobbied you all to be a part of this project. She she heard about the script and really wanted to be a part. Well, she and Tom are, are really good buddies, and uh, they've been wanting to work for together for a long time. I think Tom gave her the script, or her agent said Tom wants it. Anyway, she got in the movie. Um, she and Tom really wanted to work together. And she went on and did another movie right after ours, um, but she's great. So it really worked out. Well, Tom is amazing in this film, and obviously the, the strongest counterpart for him is Cousin Marv, is Ben um, Tell us a little bit about working with him on the project. He's so, um, so complex in this role. Yeah, uh, I mean, in some ways we felt like, um, given that we had so many people from different cultures and countries playing people from Brooklyn, it was really nice to have Jim, who gave it some authenticity and grounded it um, and it was so interesting to see him play a part that was kind of like a, akin to what he was so famous for in The Sopranos but then took it in a slightly different direction and um, you know there's a there's a temptation about that character Cousin Marv and a kind of weakness and vulnerability that Tony Soprano didn't really have at all um, so you know, and I had actually done a, a previous movie with him, and um, he was everybody's first choice. And, and he was, he's such a pleasure. I mean, he was such a pleasure to work with in every way. Very humble and very um, just wanted wanted to be great. Wanted his part to be great. Wanted the movie to be great. Worked like a dog. He was lovely. Well, we're certainly missing him. He was a, 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 a incredible talent. Um, but you mentioned uh, like, uh, that there was certainly an international cast. Tell us how you got all of them to somehow master a Brooklyn accent. It's not the easiest thing to do. Well, I, I'm not sure they all do. Um, <laughs> I, I think, you know, if you watch Tom, all of his performances, the voice he creates is, is really different and unique. I mean, obviously, most famously when he did Bane, but if you watch Locke, that's not what Tom sounds like. and he, It's sort of a big way that he gets into the character. Um, so I think the accent he does probably isn't a spot-on Brooklyn accent. It's very much Tom's interpretation and creation of that. Um, 
and then knew me, I think, you know, as a, as a native Swedish speaker, um, struggled a little bit with, with that. So our feeling was that wasn't really important because if you go to Brooklyn, there's all sorts of people who are raised in households where English is a second language or maybe she was an immigrant herself or any of those kind of, you know, anything like that works. Her character's name is Nadia. Um, there's a reference in there about her being a gymnast, the, the famous Romanian gymnast. So we sort of thought maybe her parents taught her Romanian first, you know. Um, and I think that's really representative of Brooklyn, which is people are all over the place and have different backgrounds and you can't quite pin it down. Um, and then we had all these great character actors around them who are from Brooklyn. So John Ortiz is from there, Elizabeth Rodriguez is from there. Obviously Gandolfini's comfortable with that. And then Matias, who I think probably does the, the strongest, you know, traditional Brooklyn accent without going too far into parody of Brooklyn, is actually a native Flemish speaker, which I think is extraordinary. Um, given that he's truly freakish. I mean, he can hear something once and then just he's like a perfect, perfect. Yeah, it's it's unbelievable. I mean, it's sort of unbelievable that someone who speaks Flemish as their first language has that accent in this movie. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think we've we've been asked that a lot, but I think our feeling right now is that Brooklyn is a diverse place and and. That real, you know, over the top Tony Soprano kind of accent. You don't even see that much anyway anymore. Now, uh, Dennis certainly is known for setting his stories in, in the Boston area. When at po what point did you all decide to set this in Brooklyn and, and you know make that the home for these, these characters? Well, at the point at which we were actually, pra from a practical standpoint, about to make the movie and deciding about what, you know where we were going to shoot it, um, and it happened kind of organically. I mean. New York was was uh, appearing to be a very logical place from a production standpoint, given the incentives, given the, a bunch of different things, and um, uh, it also actually appealed to Dennis because he doesn't want to be pigeonholed as only, only doing uh, Boston-specific stuff, and we uh, so it kind of happened in the pre pre production. And I think I was almost a victim of the success that Dennis has had. And Boston's become the sort of de facto place for these kind of movies now, not just Dennis's movies, but the town and you know a bunch of other ones. So I think we wanted to differentiate ourselves from that and, and not look like we're just doing another Boston crime thriller. And, and they're bad guys in all towns, so it works out. Exactly. Um, the, the locations are, are, are really phenomenal. I, I love you know Marv's Bar and and the, and the apartments and the streets. How much of this was a location? Did you do anything on stage, or was it all practical? We are four days on stage, that's it. Um, yeah, you know, when you shoot in New York, you have to shoot, um, I think 10% of your total day count has to be on the stage. So for us, that was the inside of Bob's house. Um, and then another set that we actually didn't make it in the movie. So everything else was all practical um, on location. Great, great. I know some of our members might have a question or two, so um, let me see, yes, up there. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the financing? It looked in the end like there was some foreign uh, investment also. No, it, it was a straight Fox Searchlight uh, film. They have a financing arrangement with another entity that finances, you know, at least part of every one of the movies they make. But we weren't involved in that at all. Searchlight paid for it and distributed it. Some other questions? Yes. You mentioned earlier at the time. The, the question is really whether you think you can put Tom in a movie like this now, as opposed to when you actually reach out. I think uh, I think the answer is yes. I think Tom is someone who's always going to have a very kind of diverse and complicated, um, eclectic career, which is great about him. Um, and he's not a typical movie star. He's not gonna. He's not gonna get pigeonholed in um, playing Marvel characters for the rest of his life. What, was there a lot of rehearsal, a lot of character development with the actors and the director on in prepping this, or did they just sort of show up and run with it? They just showed up and went for it. Um, I, you know, I think Mikael lets them experiment a lot on the day. Um, he's very comfortable with his actors and trusting them. But no, there wasn't. Um, there wasn't a lot of time for rehearsal just because of production considerations when they became available. Uh, I think we would have liked to have done a little bit more, but we just figured out as we went along. How long was the shoot, by the way? Just uh... 34 days. Oh, 
really quick. Nice. Other questions? Yes, right there. What scene did you shoot first? What was the first day? Uh, the first day was the scene where John Ortiz and Elizabeth Rodriguez talk in the car, in the car. Okay. and then the scene where Ortiz and Tom talk at the arm throwing. Hmm. Interesting question. Other questions out there? Anyone? Yes, up there. What about a dozen names in the credits under voice casting? What is that? Voice casting? Was that, the credit? There were about a dozen names. Was that the loop group? Yeah, the I don't know, maybe that's what the loop group was Probably. called. So, so the whole movie was dubbed. Yes. <laughs> really in Flemish. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, yes, I see one up here. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, can you? T I mean, from a producing standpoint, you unfortunately went through every producer's nightmare when James Gandolfini passed away. How did that affect post? And you know, what did you guys do? And was there ADR left that needed to be done? And you know, I mean, it's just a, a nightmare situation. It was completely horrible, uh, but mostly from an emotional standpoint, the film was finished. We, did, we didn't, weren't gonna do reshoots or additional photography. So it was really a question of how do we put this in the world in a way that makes his family feel okay, makes the audience viewing the film not so sad that they reject it, that they can't even bear to look at it. You know, it was just those kind of concerns. And at the time at which we finished, there was another film, weirdly, also that Searchlight made called uh, Enough Said. Enough Said, yeah. Which, so both these films were in the can, and neither had been given a release date. So, the, so people were kind of talking about uh, which should go first and when, you know, all that stuff. But um, it didn't, it didn't affect our post-production as much as our just feeling that we wanted to be both sensitive and also give the film the best platform it could have, the best possibility of reaching an audience, given that it you know, was gonna be um, either his last film or his second to last film. Now, you all just um, showed this at Toronto recently. What's the release plan, release plan that you have at this point? Well, it comes out on Friday. Um, <laughs> so uh, it'll be in a, you know, somewhere between six and 800 screens, um, which is exciting. It's a, it's a good screen count for a movie this size. Uh, we played in Toronto on Friday, opening night, and I think it went pretty well. And uh, we'll be in theaters on Friday. But it's an interesting exper experiment in some ways because we found, and we didn't know this at the time at which we finished the film, but um, in talking to the head of distribution for Fox, Searchlight, he said, you know, that it's weird with, the, with um, theater owners. They, it's really split. The art houses want it, and then there's a section of the commercial houses that really want it very badly. So it'll be interesting, and it'll either you know satisfy no one, or hopefully it'll satisfy both both factions. And it's such a competitive fall that our, our thought was that we could get out a little bit wider initially, you know, instead of doing a more traditional platform, maybe we could capture the audience before the sort of the big prestige movies, um, Gone Girl or The Judge or any of those you know. Oscar movies get out there. Now, I, I love the poster where you have the bridge with the gun. Have you all considered different sort of um, marketing looks for, for this? And were you ever thinking about maybe playing up the love story as part of the marketing, or is it always going to be the, the criminal element that's going to be driving your, your push? We're thinking just about the dog's head. <laughs> 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 no, we went through, there was a lot of iterations of the, of the poster for sure. Um, and we wanted something that, um, I don't know that we would have ever really sold the love story aspect just because it's kind of a light touch in the movie and you almost kind of want it to be um, just a reveal or taken for what it is. Um, so I think the idea was to highlight the guys and to try to get it, give it a sense of place um, in terms of the materials. Great. Let me see. Any, uh, yes? The pacing is so excellent. Can you talk a little about how you find the cut? Did you test it? Did it come together really quickly? You have to move a lot of no, it definitely didn't come together really quickly. <laughs> Mike got great here. Yeah. Um, we, we spent a lot of time on this one in post, and, and you know, the, the initial cut was much longer, and I think because there's so many different storylines that are connected but not connected, and don't really converge to the end, there was a lot of question of how much of that we needed in setup. Um, 
So we went through it a lot. We tested the movie three different times. Um, the test scores sort of held relatively the same regardless of what we did. So at a certain point, we said, let's just do what we think makes the most sense. And um, I think probably the most liberating thing in terms of getting the pacing to where we got it is that we realized that I think we were very concerned with explaining the drop bar and explaining the mechanics of the crime and who everyone was in this world and realized that it wasn't that kind of movie at the end of the day, uh, that it's, it's meant to be more character-driven, evocative, you know, sense of place and feeling rather than just pure plot. So I think once we pulled that back, there was a whole bunch of stuff with Ortiz investigating the Dean's murder, um, going to find his partner who's in jail, who tells him, you know, oh, he couldn't have been there, he's in the psych ward, and he realized all you need is that scene in the car where he looks at the thing and he realizes it's, it's you know, looks at the file and something's different. So I think it was just a question of figuring out what we could live without it. And once we did that, we actually we got it down further and then we went back in and actually put back in some of the character scenes. Um, and the scene with, with uh, Gandolfini and, and, and uh, his sister, Van Dowd, where they're talking about the father, which I think is one of the best acted scenes in the movie. It's something we toyed with putting in or not. And, once we got rid of some of that less interesting plot stuff, we have rooms for scenes like that. And I think that's what gives the the movie its sort of identity, really, um, is that it does have scenes like that. I also think um, more than uh, any movie I've worked on recently, anyway, this movie was hugely impacted by completely changing the score. And we had been living with a score that we didn't even realize the way in which it was kind of impacting the pacing. And, and really kind of screwing us up. And it took us a while to find our way through that and um, find a score that buoyed the tension but didn't kind of overwhelm it in a really corny, cheesy, you know, B-movie way. Um, tell us who, who did the score for you ultimately. Marco Beltrami did the score. Um, Seven million movies did the Hurt Locker and a bunch of stuff. Um, yeah, it's wonderfully haunting. Any last questions out there? Yes, way up in the back. What was your budget? They always want to know what your budget is. I think it was, you know, I think so, right? Uh, it was in the round 15, I sort of said. <laughs> well, um, thank you both for coming out. It's a wonderful film.